1959, Havana has fallen. Fidel Castro celebrates the victory of the revolution. A US-funded radio station started broadcasting false rumors of a new law that would take children away from their parents and send them to military camps or even the Soviet Union. Y los mensajes que transmitían eran madre cubana, salva a tu hijo, eh, ve a la iglesia, eh, no permitas que te lo quiten, el gobierno cubano te dejará sin tus hijos, no podrás verlo más. More than 14,000 Cuban children were airlifted from Havana to Miami. In April 1961, Cuba's scenic beaches turned into battlefields when warships filled with US-backed Cuban exiles launched a bid to overthrow the Castro government. It was the Bay of Pigs invasion, a historic event that this museum commemorates, detailing how the CIA-trained force came to invade the island nation. Se entrenan en Guatemala, pasan por Honduras y salen de Puerto Cabeza, Nicaragua. At the time, Cuba's ties to the Soviet Union were considered a threat to the United States, and Fidel Castro's brand new government had nationalized US owned businesses and property, further angering their neighbors to the north. The Bay of Pigs was set out by the CIA during President Eisenhower's term and put into action by John F. Kennedy. Cuban veterans remember vividly the battle that followed. The invasion failed. Fidel's army claimed victory within 72 hours. 1,200 prisoners would later be handed back to the US in exchange for $53 million worth of medical supplies and food. A year later, at the peak of the Cold War, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev persuaded Fidel Castro to install nuclear missiles on Cuba to even the power balance. Castro agreed, but the missiles were spotted by US spy planes before they could become operational. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. The US implemented an island quarantine to search vessels headed to Cuba. Castro urged Khrushchev to threaten a nuclear strike on the US should Cuba be attacked. But Khrushchev was desperate to avoid a nuclear war. Uh, or escalate it. And in we each spoke case, with Tom Putnam, director of the Kennedy Library. John F. Kennedy, really the hallmark is that he put himself in Khrushchev's shoes. He tried to think, what can I do? What can we do to resolve this, to help him save face? Uh, again, he showed steady resolve. He wasn't going to give in, uh, but he found a way to both be um, resolute, uh, but also find a way to defuse the crisis. Khrushchev agreed to remove the missiles in exchange for a U.S. commitment not to invade Cuba and an understanding that the U.S. would remove their nuclear weapons from Turkey. To this day, many Cubans maintain that missiles were there only for self-defense. La culpa fundamental recae en el gobierno de Estados Unidos desde la administración de Eisenhower con la administración Kennedy. La culpa, porque in the late 1970s, the U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger ordered a series of secret contingency plans that included airstrikes and mining of Cuban harbors in the aftermath of Fidel Castro's decision to send Cuban forces to Angola, according to declassified documents. If we decide to use military power, it must succeed. There should be no halfway measures. Kissinger instructed General George Brown of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during a high-level meeting of national security officials. There was also Operation Mongoose, a long-running covert CIA operation aimed at sabotaging the Cuban economy and assassinating Fidel Castro. 
there were dozens of attempts, ranging from poison pills to toxic cigars and exploding mollusks. Although the US denies it, extremist Cuban exile groups with ties to the CIA were responsible for various terrorist attacks against Cuban targets, including the bombing of this hotel in Havana, where an Italian tourist died. The Cuban civilian airliner was also blown up mid-air in 1976, killing all 73 people on board. The man accused of complicity in that attack, Posada Cariles, still lives openly in Miami. In 1980, amid growing tensions at home, Castro said that anyone who wanted to leave Cuba could do so. It provoked a mass exodus from the port of Mariel. As many as 125,000 Cubans made the journey to Florida. Castro also emptied jails and mental health facilities to join the Mariel boat lift, effectively ending attempts by U.S. President Jimmy Carter to mend relations with Cuba. They, they got the boy, they got the boy. Another major crisis came during the Clinton administration involving the fate of a five-year-old Cuban boy, Elian Gonzalez. His mother drowned in 1999 while attempting to flee Cuba to the United States and a custody battle ensued. According to Vicki Huddleston, a former U.S. official in Havana, this was a turning point. Clinton, you know, before Elian was ready to begin opening up, then you have Elian, and it's almost like, well, did Fidel really want the Elian crisis? Because he knew Clinton was trying to open up at that time. After the Soviet Union collapsed, their sugar for oil deal with Cuba ended, forcing the island into a severe economic crisis with widespread hunger and deprivation. That only started to ease after Cuba found a new economic ally and benefactor, with the election almost a decade later of Hugo Chavez in oil-rich Venezuela. But today, Venezuela's economy is itself in crisis. According to Georgetown professor Eric Langer, the Cubans are aware that this support may not last much longer. The big guy in the bloc uh, and the one who has really supported Cuba over the last uh, 10 years or so has been Venezuela. And now it's, it was quite clear to the Cubans that that couldn't keep up. <laughs> This may be one of the reasons why, in December 2014, Cuba's President Raul Castro made the historic joint announcement with U.S. President Barack Obama to restore diplomatic relations. This is a huge deal. Uh, this is really the biggest thing since uh, 1961, or perhaps since the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was only a year later. Uh, and so this really, I think, uh, can change not just uh, U.S.-Cuban relations, but will change U.S. presidential politics, and it will also change uh, the relationships between the United States and Latin America, which, as you know, have been going downhill. With the flag-raising ceremony outside the Cuban embassy in Washington on July the 20th, both countries have reopened their embassies for the first time in 54 years. One of the last vestiges of the Cold War is finally coming to an end. But after more than half a century of conflict, there is still a lot of mistrust to overcome. Restoring diplomatic relations is just the first step on a long, hard road towards normal relations. U.S. President Barack Obama said the decision to resume diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Cuba came after reaching the conclusion that 50 years of isolation was not leading to progress. Both he and Cuban President Raul Castro agreed that engagement between their nations would be more productive. Our next guest is an immigration attorney who represents many Latin American clients, among them Ilian Gonzalez, who was mentioned in our earlier report. Jose Pertierra joins us to discuss what we're likely to see between the U.S. and Cuba in the coming months. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Well, Cuba reopened its embassy in Washington in July. The United States will officially open its embassy in Havana in August. So what does this signify and what can we expect to see next? 
Well, the opening of the embassies, in a sense, is a great symbol. Um, there's nothing substantive other than the great symbol, but it is a symbol of what's going to happen in the coming months and years between the two nations. There is a normalization of diplomatic relations, but relations are still not normal between the two countries because the United States still has in place a blockade against Cuba. The United States continues to prohibit U.S. citizens from traveling to Cuba as tourists, and the U.S. continues to maintain a military base on Cuban territory. So the, the, there are many important issues that need to be resolved, but this is the beginning of a new chapter. Instead of trenches on both sides of the Florida Straits, we now see the construction of a big bridge. And it depends on how we cross that bridge from the United States to Cuba and from Cuba to the United States to see how rapidly relations can truly improve between the two countries. Well, you mentioned the blockade, also known as the uh, trade embargo. It is a major issue. There are a lot yes. of people uh, in the United States that are against lifting that. So what will it take to get there? And, and how soon do you think we could see that embargo lifted, if at all? Well, the majority of the people of the United States, according to the latest polls, particularly the Pew poll that just came out a few days ago, the majority supports the lifting of the blockade. It is certain Congress people that, particularly in South Florida, that are opposed to it. But increasingly, congressmen and senators are realizing that foreign policy of the United States is not made in Miami, it's made in Washington. And it is in the interest of the United States for the sake of its relations with other Latin American countries that the United States not continue to strangle the Cuban economy, but instead, uh, through this bridge that has now been built, engage with Cuba in commerce. It is in the interest of American businessmen. You see now American businessmen flocking to Cuba to try to be the first in line to engage Cuba in business. Uh, I think that the first thing that's going to poke a hole in this blockade is legislation that would permit Americans to travel to Cuba as tourists. Right now, they have to go through people-to-people -people exchanges and a number of things that make it prohibitively expensive because they have to go in groups and pay a, an agency in the United States to arrange the group tour. And Americans would just like to go and hang out and see for themselves without being led around in a group. And they, they're saying it's our right as American citizens to be able to go. Um, there's legislation now pending in Congress that would permit that. Uh, I don't know how quickly that will happen. I don't know if in this legislative session or the next, but it's the way of the future. It's going to happen. Secretary of State uh, Kerry will be traveling to Cuba in August for the uh, raising of the American flag at the embassy. Um, I would predict that President Obama would go to Cuba before his term is over, and that will seal the deal in a sense. It'll make it irreversible because it'll be... Uh, President Obama's Nixon in China moment. Uh, and th this and other symbols and other things that are happening with the movement in the United States towards a normal relation with its neighbor, I think is going to ultimately destroy the blockade. President Obama's already poked a bunch of holes in that blockade on December 17, when he announced a number of decisions through presidential authority that would allow licensing of internet and a number of other things. That makes the blockade more susceptible to change in Congress. But it's not enough. It has to be changed ultimately in Congress. But the U.S. president only has about a year left before he leaves office. Is there any concern that, depending on who becomes the next president of the United States, that some of what is taking place can be reversed? Well, I don't think that the normalization of diplomatic relations will be reversed. In diplomacy, it's very difficult to break relations once you've established them. There's concern that if a Republican, particularly a right-wing Republican, or perhaps a lunatic Republican, such as Donald Trump, if they were elected president, you, you would see a halting of the move 
towards complete normalization. But if somebody like Donald Trump's elected president, the entire Latin America and probably the entire world would be worried. Let's look at some of the benefits of this bridge, as you call it. Um, some of the sectors where we could start seeing more improvement, movement. You said business. Uh, there's also tourism, telecommunications, the medical field. Um, what do you think we'll start to see right away? Well, Cuba has been very good about producing medical technology. They have now a drug that treats uh, diabetes that there are many people in the United States, patients, who would like this drug. They're calling it the miracle drug in diabetes. And it's a question of getting a license to be able to do clinical trials in the United States and ultimately to sell it in this country. It takes a license from the Department of Treasury to be able to do that. I think the license is forthcoming. But that is the kind of thing that is going to create momentum for normalization of trade, because trade, by definition, is not just the U.S. sends wheat to Cuba. It's also Cuba selling things here. And Cuba has more to offer than simply cigars. So you know, you're going to see Cuba selling things that are needed in this country. Um, the, Cuba has a hepatitis B vaccine. There's a number of things that, that can be sold in the United States and will be sold in the United States. And lastly, on that note, Talk about the significance of this all happening with Raul Castro as president of Cuba. He and uh, before him, his brother Fidel Castro, have been at the top of that island nation for decades. They've seen many U.S. leaders come and go in their time. And, and now that this is finally happening, how significant is this for the Castros? Well, I think it's very significant that you know, Fidel Castro lived to see this day because normalization occurred without any concessions from Cuba to the United States. Cuba has always taken the position, I think rightly so, that the blockade was imposed unilaterally by the United States, and it was up to the United States to unilaterally move to dismantle it. Cuba does not need to negotiate something like that. Um, there's going to be issues in the coming years about compensation for properties nationalized in Cuba after the triumph of the revolution, American properties. Cuba has already negotiated that with virtually all of the other countries whose properties were nationalized. And I'm sure it's prepared to do the same with the United States. But the United States has to recognize that there must be compensation paid to Cuba also for this illegal blockade that was imposed all these years on Cuba, and also for the fact that a good part of its territory in Guantanamo has been occupied by the United States, uh, and not, as the lease said, as a naval base, but as a prison where prisoners were tortured. So I mean, that also needs to be taken into account when they talk about compensation. But I think you're going to be seeing a lot of debate on this issue of compensation in the coming years. All right. We'll leave it there. Jose Pertier, thank you so much again for your time. Thank we you. appreciate your perspective here on America's Always now. a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. America's Now.